Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Tonight we're finishing up uh, 1 John, so we'll be looking in 1 John chapter 5. So let's go ahead and get started, and here is our study for today. And we've been going through this to 1 John, we've seen a lot of idioms, and we've been comparing them to the idioms in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've been looking at several other points. And we finished up 1 John and talking about the things that you have to do in order to love your brother, which is to preach proper doctrine, uh, the essentials, because if you're not a believer, then you're not going to make it to heaven. So this whole concept of Jesus being the only Christ, Jesus being the propitiation for your sin, uh, you accepting him, etc. So he goes on, and this is kind of a continuation of it in chapter 5. So in chapter 5, we have uh, this first verse, 1 John 5, verse 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him that, that begot loves him also that is begotten. And so this is a really interesting thing going back to, again, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the whole concept of the sons of light versus the sons of darkness being the Zadok priest with the Essenes against the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What's interesting about this, if you think about this, again, we have the prophecies. If you just read the prophecies and you believe what it says, there's God that's manifested in three persons. The second person of the Trinity incarnates, uh, comes in human form in order to die for our sins. That pays the penalty for the sin nature and reconciles us to God. The event was to happen in 32 AD, and that starts the age of grace, among other things. And so that's the basic teaching from the patriarchs. That's the basic teaching in the Old Testament, if you compare them all together. And with the Pharisees coming along saying something like, um, no, that's not really how it works. There is no such thing as a Messiah uh, in that sense. He's just a uh, general that, that uh, wins a war. There's no virgin birth, etc. Despite the fact all of the Old Testament and all of the extra biblical manuscripts that say that. So again, we're coming through here, he's mentioned this. So there is no Christ consciousness. There is no reincarnated Christ. There's only one Christ who's God that comes in the flesh. Okay, so that's the story. So he's saying here, if you believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah, that story about God being incarnate, dying for our sins, if you believe that Jesus actually is the Messiah, he did die on the cross to pay for your sins, then you're born of God. If you don't, you're not. So if you're going to flip these around and do the Pharisee Sadducee thing and say, the Messiah is not even Jesus, but the Messiah is just a man. Well, then you don't believe in the story of the Messiah, let alone believe Jesus was him. So if you say that Jesus is the Messiah, but the Messiah is just a man, or Jesus had a Christ consciousness, or Jesus was one of the many messiahs because the Christ consciousness reincarnated, or anything along those lines, that's not the historical story. So that, of course, is uh, not right. So it's interesting to look at this again. So you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. If you believe that, you're born of God. That makes us all Christians. Okay. So today we have Christians in name only, and they'll say they're Christian, but they believe in reincarnation. Um, they believe that um, uh, Jesus was just a man, like a Unitarian. Um, or that there is no trinity like a cult, a, a non-Trinitarian group, things like that. Those are very dangerous groups to be in and, and ideas to be espousing. So, um, and if you love him uh, that begot him, so, so that's an interesting point too. And he says this other places, you can't love God if you don't love the Messiah. And, and again, it's, it's, it's an interesting idea because a lot of people, uh, I remember John saying that if you, if you don't believe our testimony, you're calling God a liar. Well, how? Well, because back in Matthew, God spoke. 
and actually said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Today, we would simply say, non-believers would simply say, well, it's probably been tampered with, whatever. John is saying, no, 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 that's the historical record. If you don't believe the historical record, you're calling God a liar. And it's interesting for us to think about that because a lot of times you might say, well, that's just Bible, that's whatever. That's historical record uh, from John's point of view. And it's really interesting to see that. This is serious. It's something serious that we need to look at. We don't just say, well, maybe, maybe it was tampered with, maybe this, maybe that. If you think you have evidence it's tampered with, show me the other version of the gospel or the other version of this, and we'll see if there's any merit to it. If there is no other version of it, then there's nothing to stand on. Because anytime you see something you don't like, you could always say, well, that's been tampered with. It's a really nice excuse. So uh, Jesus is the one and only Christ. That's the main point. And this is interesting, too, the idea of obedience. A lot of times we talk about faith and just believing, and that's enough. But if you believe, it's kind of like what James is saying, if you actually believe you're going to do things, then you're not going to be obedient to me. I have no authority over you, nor do I want authority over you. Um, I'm just telling you what I think the scripture says. And what I've talked to you many times before is said that I'm like a librarian. If you're not sure how to um, change a muffler in a car, you come to the librarian, they would know the Dewey Decimal System. If we have anything about that, it's going to be over here around this corner. And I can take you right to that passage and show you what it says. And then you have to decide if that works or if that's what that is correct. So I'm not the one commanding you. I'm just the one showing you things and could be off. And a librarian, if you think about it, just because I'm a librarian doesn't mean I can play a musical instrument, that I can fix a car, that I can invest wisely. I know where the books are, but I may not be an expert in any of those things. So we need to always look at our pastors that way. They're men of integrity. They care. They'll give you the best uh, advice they can, which is usually just go right back to scripture. But the scriptures are the key. Uh, so again, if God says this will hurt you and this is good for you, you start practicing that if you believe and you avoid practicing these things if you believe. So obedience to him or to scripture uh, is connected with eternal life. So this says, verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God. We love God. Um and keep his commandments for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous they're not hard for whosoever is born of god overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith now it's pretty interesting to me again i pick these things apart and i always look at them so if we love god we love the children of god which that's all of us. Um, we try to correct each other when we fall into sin or error. So if you say, I'm a Christian, but I'm leaning toward a non-Trinitarian cult or this or whatever, I'm going to take you aside and say, you're on dangerous, shaky ground. Not under my authority, but this is why. Here's the scriptures. Here's 27 verses where Jesus is God incarnate. Here's scriptures where the Holy Spirit is a person separate from the others and yet the one true God. Here's how it all fits together. So things like that. But when I see this, <clears throat> we keep his commandments. Today we have a lot of people that think, you know, the commandments are maybe the 10 commandments. Well, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't stolen anybody thing. I don't covet. Yeah, right. Anyway, so I've done, done those 10 things, so I'm okay. You know, and I, I keep the Sabbath in a sense that I go to church on Sunday, or maybe I do go to a Sabbatarian church, whatever, that kind of thing. But those are the commands of Moses, of God through Moses to the children of Israel. And the commandments we're talking about, we're talking about the Christ is Messiah. You have to believe that Christ is the Messiah. The story that was told is that he's going to come die for our sins, institute a new order 
tell us to do things. It might be different than what we've been used to or the same. Whatever he says, we do it. So this is interesting. We keep his commands, Christ's commands. Let me just for a second flip over to, here's our uh, Bible facts uh, main page, homepage. And down here we have our website PDFs. And this is one that I put together a ways back. And you can just grab these. This one here, the third one is commands. So if you click on it, it'll download this. But this is an explanation. And I, we've talked about it before. But um, there's 613 commands in the Old Testament that apply to Jews. And if you break that down, there's over 400 of them that are specifically to Levites when they're in the temple doing sacrifices. And then there's another group that are just to Levites, period. Uh, like who they can and cannot marry compared to a regular Jew, things like that. Then there are, are things that Jews do, things that kings do, things that the Sanhedrin does. And then the, the remainder kind of applies to everybody, like don't steal, don't kill, etc. Um, and that amounts to approximately 70 commands. And I noticed that the rabbis said the same thing. Let me bump this up here a little bit so we can see it better. That there's approximately 70 commands that are still functional. And what's interesting is I went through and I looked at those, and then I came out with a list of, of uh, 82 commands, same basic idea, a little more from Jesus Christ in the Gospels. And then I found 124 commands of the apostles. So it's basically the same. Some of the uh, extra commands are you have to obey John and Paul, obey what they say in the epistles. Well, that's a given, you know. But back in those days when their authority was being questioned, they had to make comments like that. So in here we have, here's the 70 that I found in the Old Testament that are still relevant because they're basic moral laws dealing with God, moral laws, uh, sexual relations, idolatry, occult, prophecy, and family. And then the lists of Christ. So these are one of the ones we would technically be really interested in. The commands of Christ, of what he said about God, doctrine, ceremonial laws, life, morality, and then the sin list, you know. And then we have the same thing from the apostles that expands to about 124. Basically the same stuff looked at differently. Y'all understand I could just say, don't steal, which is taking something that doesn't belong to you. But I could turn around and say, don't shoplift, don't rob, don't commit armed robbery. Don't do extortion, don't do blackmail, don't do swindling, um, don't break into a house. I could probably come up with a good 20 or 30 types of stealing. And it's, it's easier just to say don't steal. Although sometimes you have to. Kidnapping is man stealing in, in the King James. So same kind of a deal. So again, these same things about God, idolatry, doctrine, obeying the proper authorities, the ones you're supposed to obey, marriage, ceremonial laws, tithing, church government, Christian life in general, and the sin lists. So anyway, you can have this. This is my first attempt at that. And because, again, going back to this and looking at our John Jude, if we have to obey his commands, I want to know what his commands are. So it's pretty important. And again, it's not because I do all these perfectly that I'm a, a believer. I am a believer because I accept that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. And if that is correct, he's going to change a few things, redefine a few things, because things got defined weird uh, with the apostasy. So I want to follow his commands. Very, very important. Okay, and then next, again, going back to who Jesus is and why that's important to follow his commands. Who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Very, very important. So you have to believe that Jesus is the only Christ, the promised Messiah, the person, and that he is the Son of God. Okay, what makes it interesting is uh, I was talking with a friend that I worked with um uh, when i worked at a help desk and we had some muslim friends there that we worked with and they were basically saying you know Christ christianity islam quran the bible it's all the same thing and i said really i thought you were a christian oh yeah i'm a christian well then you know better 
Because 1 John 5 says you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now the Quran on the other on the other side says that you have to believe that Allah has no sons. So they're mutually exclusive. No matter what I believe, I'm saved by one and damned by the other. You can't have a Christian Muslim or Muslim Christian or whatever, you know, you can't put those two together. You can't say you have to believe in this and at the same time you cannot believe in that. There's no way to do that. So it's mutually exclusive. It was interesting. They said, huh, I guess I never noticed that before and then just kind of walked off. So it's anyway, but it's it again, it means what it says. This is important. Very, very important. Um, I actually mentioned that to one of my Muslim friends that I worked with. They said, well, so if we're good Muslims, you, you would believe we would make it to heaven, right? And it's like, no, because you reject Christ. It says, and I did the same thing. First John 5 talks about you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The Quran says you can't believe Allah has any sons. And he immediately said, yeah, that's right. That's what it says. And it's like, well, can I believe Jesus is his son and at the same time that God has no sons? No, that would be wrong. Okay, so then they're mutually exclusive. He's like, ooh, okay. So I didn't, you know, I wasn't saying I condemn you. But it's like, no, the manuscripts are pretty, and, and they respect that. The Muslims, more so than anybody else, when you say, well, the Quran says, would go, ah, no, it does not. Or they would say, yes, you've got it right. Because they know it. Uh, the people over here in the United States that call themselves Christians usually don't even know what the scripture says. And that's pretty bad if you think about it. So um, you have to believe that Jesus is the only son of God and the only Christ. So who is he that overcomes the world? but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And this is interesting, too. Uh, one of uh, my Muslim, a different Muslim guy that I worked with, uh, made the comment about uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls kind of prove the New Testament's messed up, doesn't it? And it's like, no, it's pretty rock solid. And he said, ooh, looks like our way of life is doomed. And he just kind of walked off. But uh, same kind of thing with this. If, if this says this, you know, you have to understand this. One of the arguments, though, is that this is New Testament doctrine. It's just messed up. Of course, now we know one argument against that is the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about the Messiah being the Son of God, being God incarnate, etc. So it's the same basic doctrine. So whether it's right or wrong, the writers of the New Testament didn't make it up. And that's a very important point that really can't be argued anymore. But going back even further, when you look at Proverbs chapter 30, what does it say? Uh, what is God's name, if you can tell me? And what is the name of his son? It's a riddle, you know, a prophetic riddle back in Proverbs 30. Proverbs were written by Solomon and David. Some of them are more ancient. Some of them are afterwards in Hezekiah's time. But basically, uh, somewhere between the really old stuff, who knows how old it is, but Solomon was around 1,000 B.C., Hezekiah around 600 B.C., 650, something like that. So in that area, then, is when the Proverbs are written. So you're talking at least 500, or actually 600 or more B.C. for all of the Proverbs that talk about God having a son. So again, it's the consistent teaching of the old ones, of the ancients, um, the Zadok priest, that the Messiah is God's son. Okay, and then we have the witness. This is interesting, too. This gets into something interesting. Almost every modern Bible will pull out First John, part of 1 John 5, 7, and part of 1 John 8. And they pull it together and say it's not, it shouldn't be in there, even though grammatically it almost has to be. We'll look at that here in a second. But this is why it's important at this point. Um, this says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. Um, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. 
So that's showing the Trinity. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Father, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. And what most translations will do, and this is what it'll be in like a King James, a New King James, any of the TR-based Bibles, most of them will take, there are three that bear record in heaven, and they'll take this part right here out. So what's highlighted is out. So they'll just have it read this way. There are three that bear record in heaven, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And they'll say that middle part was added. Well, in Greek, you have to, well, let's back up. In English, in English, um, you have to agree um, with the, in the proper grammar. And part of that is gender. If I said my pastor and I were at church, he said this, and then I said this to him, and then she gave me a glass of water. At that point, you'd know you're missing part of the story because the pastor is a he, I'm a he, but there's this she that gave me a glass of water. It's not the pastor. So where did this other person come through? Come from? You, you, you know, it's somebody must have walked in the door or something, but you know more of the story because the genders have to agree. Well, in Greek, you've got gender, tense, mood, and voice that all have to agree. And this does not fly grammatically if you cut that center part out. And so what's interesting about this is, and I, I mentioned it, I think I mentioned it down here in this one, I believe. Okay, I probably don't then. Um, in our book called The Ancient Word of God, I go through a lot of this kind of stuff. But basically, Jerome was writing the, um, the Vulgate, right? And he gets to the part where he's writing the general epistles. And he actually writes a prologue or an introduction to the general epistles in which he says that some people cut this verse out and say that it doesn't exist in Greek, so it must have been added later. I have many manuscripts that have this in Greek. Now, we don't have any today, as far as I know. Um, but that's kind of a misnomer too, because you've got 5,300 and some odd manuscripts. None of them have this. They're not full Bibles. Out of the 5,000 some odd manuscripts, I think there's probably about 20 that might have First John. And out of that, those tend to be fragmented. The ones that actually have First John chapter 5, where, this, where we could see if this is true or not, I think there's six copies. So that's not enough to really look at anything. But he testifies that it did exist in Greek and that it was there. And he begins to explain the story of how it was cut out. What happened was there is a group of people that were non-Trinitarian. They were called Praxians. And Praxians are basically like oneness people today. They were saying that God the Father and Jesus Christ are the same person. And this is the only place where it says these three are one. And so the Praxians would always go to this verse and say, these three are one, meaning they're one and the same person. And so some of the Greek fathers thought, we've got 27 verses that refer to Jesus' divinity. If we simply cut this one piece out uh, right here to here, it would still flow. And they wouldn't be able to use the three are one in the same person argument. Jerome is saying that he's a Trinitarian. He understands that we have the 27 verses for Christ's divinity. But no matter whether it works or doesn't work, it's never proper to cut out a part of Scripture. It's there for a reason. Now, you'll notice it doesn't say three in one person. There, these three are one in the same person. It just says that they're one in some way, which is the concept of a trinity. So to get around oneness people that would misuse this verse, some of the church fathers cut it out. And he said he refuses to cut it out because he has the Greek text that have this in it. It's just a really interesting argument from church history. Now, Jerome's not authoritative. He's just a church father, maybe even an early Catholic father. So you might put him in a even a lower state of normal church fathers. 
But the point is, he, he, he bears witness to a text. He's not telling you how to define it. He's saying there's a group of people that cut this verse out for might, it seems like a good logical reason, but I believe it's never proper to cut anything out for any reason. If somebody looks at this wrong and goes and becomes a cult, I feel for them, but I'm still not tampering with scripture. You know, so it's an interesting, interesting idea. To, uh, to give you a point here, let me just pull this up real quick. This is my e-sword, and here's 1 John 5, and we'll go to, here's 7. And you can see what it says. These three bear witness in, in heaven, the Father, Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. So if we go to the LITV, it's going to say the same thing. Uh, if we go to the ISV, for instance, notice what it does. It cuts it out. Verse 7 is this. These, for there are three witnesses. You can tell you're missing something in that verse. And then in five, it simply says the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one. So they kind of just shrink them together. Um, here's the Syriac. Of course, the Syriac has the same. It's high, it's uh, um, grayed out and uh, italicized in this just to let you know that whoever edited this said this is normally not thought of to be original but somehow it made its way into the Syriac because it's always been there but anyway um, modern King James has it properly so you'll see a lot of these different things like that here is the um, um, Greek Orthodox and you'll see it's the same so it's really interesting just to kind of see that. I just wanted to throw that in. And a lot of you have asked, how do I know if I have a good Bible, if it's really a good TR-based Bible? Um, that's what I would tell you to do to start with, just to make sure um, whether it has this in there or not. Um, I got really excited when the Holman Standard Bible came out. Uh, it's, it was done by Baptist, I think the Southern Baptist, one of them anyway, Holman Christian Standard Bible. Because it says on there it was going to go by the received text. And I thought, oh, this is great. And so I look it up, grab it, go to the Christian bookstore, look at it. First thing I do is come to this verse. It's not there. So I'm like, okay, somebody's doing something weird. So I go back and look at it. And the chief editor is said he was going to do it TR-based. And he basically did. Uh, when, they, when the project was about two-thirds done, the chief editor passed away. A new chief editor came on board that decided they need to follow the critical text model. So they went ahead and removed a lot of those verses. I don't know if they ever put it back in or not, because it, coming from a Baptist theology, it's got to be a pretty decent Bible, I would think. you know. But I was very disappointed because I'm always looking for new, better English Bibles. Uh, for people, especially people that um, are English as a second language. They're having a hard time anyway, so King James just floors them. So anyway, but so this is important here. That's the history behind this one verse. Now you guys are all experts. Um, so anyway. So, uh, but the point of this is that um, you, you're bearing witness of this. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, and so the point, the reason why these two verses are kind of important, it's not just repeating itself, is because of the witness and the prophecy. So remember when Jesus was being baptized, uh, the God the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is standing here in the water, testifying that he is Messiah. He's allowing himself to be baptized. And to show that it's true, the Holy Spirit is descending on him in the form of a dove. So you've got three witnesses right here, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bearing witness from heaven to Jesus being the Messiah. And that's what we're talking about here. So the three that bear witness in heaven are the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. They're one in the same tri triune God. Okay, but then verse 8 says... There are three that bear witness in the earth, that is the spirit, the water, and the blood. 
So the fact that Jesus incarnated in human flesh, shed his blood, which is the fulfillment of the prophecies, and the Holy Spirit came, and you would know that if you are a believer. You would have had a manifestation of the Spirit. Um, and talking to a Pharisee at this point, you know the, the Sadducee view, the Pharisee view, and the Zadok view, and you've rejected all of them in favor of what, whichever you are, Pharisee, Sadducee, or whatever. But you know that the prophecies are the Messiah would come and do miracles, raise the dead, heal the blind, and, and Jesus did this. You know he was supposed to come at a certain time, and, and he came at that time. You know he was supposed to die and resurrect. He died and resurrected. He's supposed to start a new, a, a new order, and a new order is forming. The sign is miraculously that God would rip the, t the veil of the temple in half when this happens and you guys wouldn't want that but all of a sudden in a day boom temple veil is ripped in half humans can't do that so you can't blame the christians or the zadok priests or how in the world first you'd have to figure out how in the world they did it how could they do something like that there's temple guards all the time that have to come in and get out real quick how do you rip a curtain like that when teams of horses can't pull it apart and the beam and everything, you know, how do you comp accomplish something like that? So you have all these witnesses on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. So there's at least three, if not more, prophetic witnesses that Jesus is the Messiah. And so this is why it's important to know that we've got the, the witnesses from heaven, which is at his baptism, and these are at his death, what happened afterwards. So there are two sets of three witnesses. And that's why you can't just cut this in half and just make it one. It garbles the entire thought and point of the text. So, okay. So, and then there's there's also several quotes from Cyprian and other church fathers that quote this in its entirety. So in there, but... So the witness of the Father is what's important in the Son and the Holy Spirit. So 1 John 5, 9 through 10 says this. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And this is, he's continuing the same thought. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all testified that Jesus is Messiah at his baptism. So if you receive the witnesses of three people, for instance, if that's lawful, the three witnesses of God ought to be much more important. For this is the witness of God that he testified of his Son back at Jesus' baptism. He that believes on the Son hath the witness in himself. He that believes not, God hath made him a liar, because he believes not the record that God gave for his Son. So this whole thing is an explanation of the first part of that that they keep trying to cut out. You don't believe the record of Matthew that says that God spoke and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Pay attention to him. You don't believe God said that or you would accept Jesus as Messiah. So you're saying the scriptures tampered with somehow God didn't say that. That's God's making you out to be a liar because you're saying, I don't believe that this is correct. Well, historically it's correct. Physically it's correct. Spiritually it's correct. It's the record or the witness that God gave about his own son. And this is where it's at. It's Matthew 17. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, and whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So this is a second witness, basically. It happened at Matthew 3, 16, and also in Matthew 17, 5. So very important. So it's interesting when you look at the whole thing, it's like, yeah, you can't cut that out grammatically and you can't cut that out because you missed the whole point of the chapter. So here's the next, next part, verses 11 to 12. This is the record that God gave to us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. The Messiah is the one that grants eternal life. He that has the son has life. He that does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. So again, if you're a Pharisee or a Sadducee, you must convert. And it's a no-brainer 
what other person could come and somehow heal the blind, resurrect dead people, resurrect himself, and have the witness of God and the witness of prophecy? I don't care how you try to tweak it. Like They argue uh, against us by saying, well, you can make certain scriptures into whatever you want to make them into. Some of them you can. Other people say, well, that's so specific that everybody knows what it is. Somebody went out and made it happen. Some you could do that with. But again, like Israel coming back in these last 70 years, there's been over 50 prophecies, some kind of vague, some very specific. Altogether, there's no way. One or two could be a coincidence, but not all of them together. Like Jesus being born in Bethlehem. He made himself be born in Bethlehem. Okay, well, his parents decided to go to Bethlehem and wait around until he was born so they could claim he's Messiah. Okay, one out of 150 prophecies could be manipulated like that. Let's go to number two and just go down. The, pretty soon you're going to realize, yeah, that's not, no, uh-uh. So, he that has the Son has life. If you accept Messiah, you have eternal life. Just accept him and, and obey and go forward. And then he ends up, uh, the next one here says, These things I've written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you will know that you have eternal life, that you believe on the name of the Son of God. This is a really cool verse because I've got friends uh, I've got friends that believe in eternal security, that you can't lose your salvation. I've got other friends that believe that you can lose your salvation. And I've got a small handful of friends that think that every time they do something bad, they lose their salvation and they have to get it back again. Like if I stub my toe and I cuss, the sin nature comes out, I've instantly lost my salvation, right? So now i got to repent, get saved again, that kind of thing. This verse here shows that that's not even a possibility. Because there is a way uh, that you can know that you currently, right now, have eternal life. Okay, I'm not arguing that you can or cannot lose your salvation, but this whole idea of up and down, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. No, it doesn't work that way. And very, very important to look at this and see this. You don't have to worry about accidentally losing your salvation so another thing that goes along with this that i point all the time uh, out all the time is in uh, hebrews 12 and 13 it's talking about some of these things and it talks about that if you are a true believer and you willfully walk in sin god will chastise you if you are claimed to be a believer and you're willfully walking in sin and there's no chastisement it simply proves one thing you're not a christian it's just all there is to it so to have that and take that coupled with this, there is a way you can know that you're a Christian. Uh, if I deliberately start walking in sin, I'm still a Christian. I'm still saved, but God's going to discipline me. Now, some of my friends would argue, well, much, much later, he might kick you out of the kingdom. Okay, well, that's that's a different subject for another time. But right now, the point is, I can try my best, which is walking in faith, and I stay saved. I can stumble into sin, and apparently I'm still saved. I can deliberately walk in sin, and apparently I'm still saved because I'm going to be disciplined. Does that make sense? So, in other words, I could kind of see why some people believe in eternal security, and I can kind of see why some people believe you might lose it, but the stuff in the middle, I mean... If you can lose your salvation, it would be extremely hard to do so. And looking at all this evidence in the middle, you don't have to worry about stubbing your toe, saying a bad word, and having to get saved again. You don't accidentally lose your salvation. So that's basically it. So and there's good denominations on both sides of that argument, but I don't know of any denomination that wouldn't teach this. You don't accidentally lose your salvation. Um, but I have friends in denominations that don't fully understand what their denomination teach and think that they, you know, lose have lost their salvation and gotten resaved 
20 or 30 times in their life. It's like, yeah, that's not possible. Um, obviously, they're believers because they try hard. They just think somehow that they can accidentally lose it. Anyway, so this is a real key verse for that. Uh, that you there is a way that you can know that you currently right now have eternal life and you don't have to worry about accidentally killing yourself you're you're taken care of or even on purpose it was starting to walk in sin god will discipline you this is the confidence that we have in him if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if we know that he hears us Whatsoever we ask, we know we'll have the petitions that we have desired in him. Sometimes God says no, and no means no. But sometimes he waits for us to ask, and sometimes he's waiting for the situation to arise so that you can do this without injuring yourself. And so, but we have those petitions. And as Christians, we're wanting our loved ones to get saved. We're, we're wanting to serve him. We're wanting him to guide us. If we pray those things, he will actually guide us. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. This is an interesting, interesting verse because we know that God would hear the prayer of a sinner when the sinner repents. Otherwise, you couldn't get saved. So we're not talking about that. But people that um go to church or even don't go to church that just do stuff and then they pray to god and expect god to do something for them he has no responsibility or no obligation to do anything well for anybody really but he does for his kids and a good example of this i think is how many times have you noticed i used to do security work in a hospital a long time ago somebody would um, have an accident and be on the brink of death and they don't know if they're going to make it out of surgery so you see the relative down in the chapel praying oh god if you just save them i'll do anything i'll convert my life i'll start going to church i'll do this i'll do that all of a sudden someone comes down and says it was close but they made it through the surgery they're going to be fine no you don't need to worry they're out of the woods now then, of course, the attitude is like, well, you knew I was upset. You know, I didn't really mean it. It's just, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. So you come to someone, to God, when you want something. But when everything is okay, you just go on and do your own thing. Uh, the Epistle of Barnabas makes mention of this. Uh, the, the kosher food laws that the Jews do. It's not because the food is bad. It's because the food represents something. And in contrast, you're supposed to eat beef, but not eat pork. And the Epistle of Barnabas explains it this way. The, uh, the cow chews its cud. And that's an example of uh, taking the word of God in, thinking about it, bringing it back, bringing it in again, bringing it back up, thinking about it. So it's this, this um, symbol of constantly studying the word because you want to serve God. The pig, on the other hand, is, is the kind of animal when you call it, if it's hungry, it's right there. If it's full at the moment, it won't come. It could care less. So the contrast between a pig and a cow is that you're supposed to be the person that wants to serve God will do your best to serve God. You can't be perfect, but that's not the issue. As opposed to the person that is the pig, that is like the person in the chapel, in the hospital, saying they'll do anything until their loved one's out of the woods. And then, of course, I didn't mean it, and they go about their own way. So very important. So I think that's what John's referring to here. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners because they're not serious. If they were serious, they'd become Christians, right? Or they would eventually, they would start seeking, you know. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. So you can be a believer and be saved and also not doing his will. You could be walking in sin, in which case you'd be disciplined. And God might say, you might be praying to God, take me out of this problem. As soon as you start doing what you're supposed to do, I'll take you out of the problem. That's discipline from the Father. So if you're a worshiper of God and you do his will, he hears you. 
And then we have this other one here. Uh, this is kind of a confusing one for a lot of people. Uh, if any man sees his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and it shall be given him life for them that sins not unto death. There is a sin unto death, and I do not say that you should pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, but there is a sin that is not unto death. And this has been described in several different ideas, but uh, this is just my opinion. But my opinion on this is not that it's not talking about spiritual death, because I don't know how to tell that. If I grew up with you and I think you're a Christian, you sure look like it. Then all of a sudden you get upset one day, something happens and you reject Christ officially and you go become a Buddhist or something. I've known people that have done that and probably died and went to hell. But I've known people that have done things like that, that have wake, woken up, should I say that word, um, come back to the Lord. And they just, you know, had a kid's fit, you know, through a tantrum is basically, and the Lord disciplined them. And now they're back. So, um, and I know people that are Buddhists and Hindus and other things that have converted to Christianity that seem to be rock solid. So my point is, just because you say you don't believe anymore and you walk away, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, you're not, you're sinning right now and you're going to be disciplined at least if you are a Christian. Maybe you never were. Maybe I was confused, but whatever. I can't tell. I can just see what you're doing. I can't you know, tell the heart necessarily. However, what I can tell is if you're alive or dead. So my way of looking at this is suppose you and I um, decide to rob a bank. So we go in, we rob the bank, we come out, there's policemen all around. They say, stop or we'll shoot. I freeze because I'm kind of a coward. You take off. The policeman shoots you and you die. I'm arrested, tried, convicted, and put in prison for a number of years. Now, the point is, we did the same exact sin, but you're dead because of the sin. There's no sense of anybody praying for you. Your fate is sealed. I'm still alive. You need to pray for me because there is a chance I could repent and become a Christian because I'm still alive. And I think that's what we're talking about here. If we do a sin, and it's not named because it could be any sin, but if you sin and it causes your death, you don't pray for dead people because it doesn't do any good. Um, this actually also gives us an idea that we shouldn't be praying to saints or, or other, other creatures, just praying to God, which is what the church father said anyway. Uh, so, all unrighteousness is sin, but there's a sin that's not unto death. So, pray for me as long as I'm still alive to repent and become a Christian. Don't waste your time praying for people that have already passed on, because the Lord will judge them however he judges them. Okay, and it ends, then two more pieces here. We know that whosoever is born of God sins not. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. We know that we are of God, and the whole word, world lies in wickedness. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. So again, Jesus is the Son of God. This is the true God and eternal life. So again, he's hitting it hard. You have to believe in the Messiah. You have to follow his commands. And it's not even so much his commands versus Moses' commands. It's his commands versus how the Pharisees interpret things. You have to follow Christ's commands. Everybody's going to say, don't murder people. Don't steal. You know, don't fornicate. Don't, don't bow down to an idol. I mean, everybody's going to be right there on those things. But there are other things equally important that the Pharisees are going to tell you to go this way when Messiah says go this way. So this is what's interesting. So whosoever is born of God, sin is not. A good, a good way of interpreting this is practicing sin. And remember I said that if you, in, in Hebrews, it talks about if you practice sin, God disciplines you. So here's that whole thing again. 
um, I can fall into sin, I repent, I can try my best. When I start to walk in sin, God disciplines me. And I can't persist in sin because of my own conscience and the discipline of God. It just doesn't work. And some of us can stick around and, and we have this willful arrogance, you know, like the, uh, the kid that's throwing a tantrum. Some kids are just so strong-willed, their tantrums can go, it, it can be scary. And, and then other people, you can just not even spank them, but just say bad, and they repent. So in this case, uh, I think it's saying here that you, you cannot, in good conscience, continue to sin and practice sin for a long time. It begins to bother you. It bothers you very much. And you have to stop regretting what you're doing. And then he ends by saying, little children, keep yourself from idols. And then amen. And I thought this was interesting because I, idols is idolatry, of course. And when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I've told you this before, their definition of idolatry, a full, full-blown idolatry is bowing down to an idol some statue of a Buddha or a Mary or a something and praying to it, that kind of thing. But they referred to the Pharisees as idolaters, even though the Pharisees would have never, it's one thing they wouldn't have done is have actual small idols in the temple or on their person or whatever. So idolatry is walking away from the Messiah and the teachings. They formed their own type of Judaism that said, there is, there is a Messiah that's just a general. There's no virgin birth. There's no God incarnate. There is no sin nature. There's no reason for us to repent or anything. The rituals or the sacrifices can take care of that stuff. We don't need anything like that. That's not the gospel. That's not what's been preached by the patriarchs and the scrolls, by Moses in the Old Testament. That's totally different, but it's in the context of religious stuff. So if you go to a church today that says Jesus was just a man, like a Unitarian, improper. That's that's an idolatry situation. They've made their own type of Christ. So if you go somewhere where they, they believe that Jesus or the Messiah was just a man or an incarnate angel or whatever, they've made their own religion. And it sounds and looks like biblical theology, but they've made up their own version which is a form of idolatry. So I think that's pretty interesting. So he's actually using a scene language here, saying you've got to keep yourself away from any idolatry that's out there. None of them would have, well, it's made the, the, the Romans would have done actual idolatry, but all of the Jews and the Jewish converts would not have touched that with a 10-foot pole, but they might feel like they would want to go back or listen to Pharisees. If you know the Pharisees are, everything the Pharisees and Sadducees are right on, so are we, in all the moral points. But the things that we differ on, if theirs is idolatry, why would you even speak to one of them? At least you get confused. You know, Satan is crafty, and there's some really crafty explanations. And if you listen to the wrong voice long enough, you will confuse yourself, because you're human. I would do the same thing especially if you listen to the wrong voice long enough and do not read the scriptures. So keep yourself from idols. When you know something is wrong or there's something wrong with a certain group, don't go back and study with part of them. Just stick with the group that you know. Okay, and then I've got a lot of other things in here about different people that have forsaken to become idolaters and stuff. So we'll go ahead and stop there uh, for tonight. Let me turn one of these off here. Okay, and now we'll go back and look at the, do the Q&A part, see if there's any questions on this. We're not going to have a Thursday night Q&A this week uh, because I'm going to be down in Missouri doing some stuff with Skywatch TV. So that'll be really exciting when those things come out. Um, I am working on the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. I'm getting ready to release that next Monday. This finishes up our study with 1 John. Next Monday, there's a study I want to do with you guys on the phrase Age of Ages, which is found in the Melchizedek document in the scrolls. We'll look at that. 
and it's it's not easy to see because of the way it's translated into English, but Paul uses that phrase in the same way multiple times in the New Testament. So I think it's going to be a really exciting thing. That'll throw us back into the calendar system, and I'll be able to show you the new graphics and how everything works, and I think it'll be really exciting. I'll go ahead and say good night. Uh, God bless you guys, and we will see you um, um, Monday. God bless. Have a safe week.